Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Karina Van Vliet, a very proud member of the City Club and a former political affairs officer at the United Nations. I am thrilled to introduce today's speaker, co-founder and executive director of the International Civil Society Action Network, Sanam Narigi Anderlini. Today, we mark the International Day of Peace. It was established by the United Nations General Assembly in 1981 to encourage us all to remember that peace is our collective, never-ending mission. And it invites us every year on September 21st to recommit to continuing our fight for peace. We need World Peace Day because, unfortunately, conflicts, many of them long-standing, persist across the globe. This year, the theme for Peace Day is the right to peace to celebrate the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1948. Hashtag stand up for human rights. And there is no better speaker to discuss the intersection of peace, conflict, and human rights than Ms. Naragi Anderlini. The rights of many individuals are violated by war, in particular, the rights of women and girls. And yet, how women and girls are impacted by conflict, how their experiences may differ from those of men and boys, whether or not they're included in the peace talks, these are issues that were long overlooked by the international community until colleagues like Sanam Narigi Anderlini came along. Ms. Naragi Anderlini was among the civil society drafters of UN Security Council Resolution 1325. This landmark resolution in October of 2000 was the first time that the international community, after centuries of women being combatants, of women managing businesses and households with men off at war, of women and girls suffering untold attacks and violence, the first time that the international community recognized the particular toll that conflict takes on women and girls and the vital role that they often play in building lasting and sustainable peace once the guns go silent. This was an incredible achievement for women all over the world. For over two decades, Ms. Naragi Anderlini has been a leading international advocate, researcher, trainer, and writer on conflict prevention and peace building from a gender perspective. She was the first se senior expert on gender and inclusion on the United Nations Mediation Standby Team, deploying to conflict zones and supporting women in very difficult contexts to find the courage to fight for that seat at the table at the, in their peace processes. Iranian by birth and now a citizen of the United Kingdom, Ms. Naragi Anderlini holds an MPhil in social anthropology from the University of Cambridge. Ladies and gentlemen, members and friends of the City Club of Cleveland, please join me in welcoming to the stage Sanam Naragi Anderlini. very much. I've already taken my jacket off. You'll probably see me rolling my sleeves up in a minute. Um, uh, thank you, Karina. Thank you, Stephanie, for this wonderful invitation. I had never been to Cleveland, but it was kind of close to me, to my heart, because my father used to come here in the late 80s, and he always used to say how friendly Cleveland was. So he's here with me in spirit now. Um, I also want to thank you for the lunch, because uh, often in my line of work, we raise uncomfortable truths. So dinner invitations after the talk don't come that often, so I'm glad that I've been fed <laughs> in advance. Um, and very happy to be talking to you today about the role of women in, uh, in peace and security in a club that was originally founded for the opinions of men, all men. But, um, so, so it's really lovely to be here uh, um, on this day, and especially on International Peace Day. I sometimes wonder why we have one peace day. We should have 364 peace days and one war day where all the guys that want to fight and you know have their weapons and they can just go into a war games room and duke it out and 
and leave the rest of us alone, it would be quite nice to, to switch the, 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 the ratios around. But, um, but to be serious, I think that what we need to do is just think about peace, what that actually means. Um, because those of us who live in peace, we take it for granted. It's kind of the invisible canvas on which we paint our lives. We go to work, our kids go to school, we fret about college applications, that's my deal right now, I have twins, so it's double the, double the anxiety for me. They're, they're dealing with it quite well, I think. Um, so, but, but just imagine this, that, that you're, you know, you're, it's your son's wedding and all of a sudden a missile comes from out of the blue and everyone's dead at the wedding. Imagine that you're a college kid and you're taking your exams and next door the rooms, the, the, the windows have been blown out of the classroom next door. That was the story of a young uh, Syrian woman that I met who was 21 and she had seen untold devastation just in her own city. Um, in Basra right now, in Iraq, they don't have water and electricity. This is, a, this is a town that produces oil. And yet, because of the war, and 50 degrees centigrade heat, I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit, but, it, but it's extraordinary. So this is what happens when you have war in your midst. And yet, at the same time, these stories also tell us something else. That number one piece is precious, so without it, we, we, everything we have is at risk, so we mustn't take it for granted. But second, that regardless of what's happening, people have hope. Why does somebody have a baby in the middle of war? Why do you get married? Why do you go to school? Why do you insist on going to school? Because you anticipate a future. And this, this is in itself the idea of, of Khalil Gibran, the, the Lebanese-American Lebanese poet, who said, this is life's longing for itself. So, so to me, the idea is that human nature, our default is living in peace and coexistence. Right? Wars and violence, these are aberrations. And we must recognize that because so often we're told that that's the human nature. Violence is human nature. It's not. It really isn't, right? But it's also this other aspect that if we don't preserve and if we don't invest in peace, uh, what are we losing, right? Think about all the kids that are in refugee camps right now. How many Marie Curies or Georgia O'Keeffe's or Mozart's are there whose potential isn't being fulfilled? And, and in a way, the, the, the way I like to think about it, it is that if we take peace for granted in our lives, it's a little bit like saying to Picasso, we want a masterpiece. We give him the best oil paints, but we give him a canvas that's totally shredded. And then we wonder why the paint keeps falling through and nothing happens, right? So, so it's really understanding that that, that that invisible canvas is absolutely essential to all our lives. But where are we? So since 9-11, since 2001, um, not only we've taken peace for granted, we've actually exploited it. In the name of peace and security, we've helped all sorts of authoritarian states rise and leaders. We've undermined democracy, we've undermined human rights, we've undermined the rule of good law. We have lots of bad laws all around the world, including in this country, um, all in the name of, of peace and security. But, and what has it actually given us, these 17 years? Well, by relying on lethal force, we've actually metastasized those extremist forces that were there. So Al-Qaeda is still there. And then there was ISIS, and we think ISIS is gone, but the next version of ISIS is just around the corner. The, the more violence we have, the more violence we have enabled. And to put a dollar figure to this, we've spent $2 trillion in the last 17 years, and it's not really getting us anywhere. And if I, if I just give you the ratio in terms of peace, in 2016, for every $1 that we spent on peace and development, we were spending 1,885 on things to do with war, defense, security, and military. Just, just think if we change that ratio a little bit, where, where the world would be. And we're often told that you know, war and peace, it's, 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 as I say, national security, techno jargon, we don't understand. The grown-ups in the room, they know, they're handling it. Um, it's deemed to be a test of masculinity and denote courage. But let's just un unpack a little bit what's going on in the wars that we have today in the contemporary context. You know, if we look back 100 years at World War I, 90% of the casualties of war were soldiers, young men caught in the trenches in, in Europe, um, at the front, the battlefront, right? There was, there was a battlefield and a battlefront. By World War II, these bombings of, of cities came into place, so we had 50% of people being killed were civilians and 50% were soldiers. But still, there was a notion of the front and the back, and going and home was a safe space. In contemporary war, since the end of the Cold War in 1989, we, we've lurched into a new era.
The wars we're experiencing are mostly civil wars. They're complicated wars because now we have state armies, we have paramilitaries, we have rebels, we have terror groups, we have regional powers, superpowers. They're all coming together into one place, all vying for influence. But because these wars are fought within nations, the home is the front, right? There is no battlefield out there somewhere. It's literally people's houses and, 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 and cities and streets. And even when we have foreign soldiers enlisted to go to Iraq and Afghanistan, they may be far away from their own homes, but they're close to somebody else's home. They're close to somebody else's kids. And, and as a result, that's why we get the civilian deaths, right? It's because it's happening in and around civilians. And what are we doing? We're killing doctors and journalists, engineers and musicians and poets, not to mention kids and babies. So if we think about back to the leadership and the notion of courage, what strength is there? What kind of, what, why do we think it's strong to be killing unarmed civilians? Why do we think that when we say strong men leaders, what's strong about putting journalists and human rights activists in jail? All they have is the power of the word and the power of the pen, right? To, it's, it's almost spinelessness. It's actually what we're seeing is these, these, we're seeing bullies that are spineless who can't deal with dissent and, and fear truth to power. And what they do is they come after, as I say, the human rights defenders, or they, you know, they take you know, kids to, to court for deportation, um, instead of actually looking at the underlying causes, looking at the gun lobbies and the, and the defense contractors or the criminal gangs or the other forces that are actually out there benefiting from the violence that, that, that we see. So where did, what's all this got to do with women? Well, when, when we think about wars coming or violence coming into our, into our communal spaces, women are obviously front and center at home in the community and elsewhere. And increasingly, increasingly as activists, they're being targeted. And we also see that where rape is being used as a tactic of war between ethnic communities or religious communities, women's bodies have literally become the front line of that war. That their, their bodies are the battlefield, basically, of men vying for, for control amongst each other. And for 20 years, my work in the global agenda of women, peace, and security that, that uh, uh, Karina mentioned has centered around a very simple idea, that women's voices and experiences of war, of survival, of what it takes to care for others, the struggle to end war and make peace, their vision of the future, and very importantly, their definition, our definition of security and national security and what that should mean, should be part of the discourse and should they should have that voice at the tables where these decisions are being made. Not because they only benefit women, but it's actually because they benefit everybody. And I'm not suggesting that all women become peacemakers. Some people support violence and war, some are just trying to struggle and survive. But in every conflict, in, in, in the 20 years or more that I've been in this space, I have found that every time a new conflict arises, we see women coming up. We see, sometimes they're just a handful, but then it spreads. And, and we see more and more that, that it's always women who are the first ones to also call out for peace. And I have the privilege of calling many of these women my partners. We have an alliance of, uh, in now over 35 countries, um, of members called the Women's Alliance for Security Leadership. And what I say is that they're not experts at war making, but they sure are experts at peacemaking. And if we're, in, we're interested in ending the scourge of war, they need to be listened to and their advice needs to be heeded. And so today I thought that to capture the essence and universality of what they bring to my work, I would share with you some of their words in terms of what this agenda and, and this work is around. So first, I bring to mind um, a colleague of mine, Dr. Pauline Riak of South Sudan. She is a, the Deputy Vice Chancellor of the University of Juba and a long-term peace activist. <coughs> and she's been one of six women who's been at the negotiations table in a, in a war that's been going on for five years. It's a new country and they've, they've, been, they've been at war for the last five years. And this is what she said just a couple of months ago. She said, in South Sudan, women don't have the time to die. Right? Just, just think about what that means. What she means, she says, young men are busy killing each other. The elders, the elder men and the leaders of the, of the communities are so traumatized by what's happening to their society that they're actually becoming ill and, un and just unable to cope. But the women, Every day, they have to get up, they have to fetch water, they have to fetch firewood, they have to care for the elderly and the sick and the young and so forth. They just don't have time to die, right? This holds true for women everywhere. In Syria, since 2011, there's been an exodus of men and boys, some fleeing the clutches of the armies and mil militias, 
others dying in the fight, others leaving to find jobs to help their families, and it's left women and children. In Yemen, the International Red Cross was, was forced to pull out, and the, a local group that, that we've been trying to support called Food for Humanity negotiated with armed groups to let food and mes medicine into a town of Thais. The head of the organization, um, Mona Lokban, said, the road ahead is long for us. Even if the war ends now, there's a lot needed to save the people. These are just ordinary people like you and I who had to rise up and do something because all they have is the power of caring. Right? That, that's what fuels them to ca carry on. So, and, and then from one of the things that I've always, that's always struck me is that so often it, we see images of women in the midst of conflict, holding a baby, surrounded by children, seemingly helpless in refugee camps, right? But think about it for a moment. Regardless of what they've endu endured or what they will endure, they're still thinking about feeding those children and protecting them. And they're not passive victims. They're survivors and they're caretakers. They're courageous and they're empowered, even though sometimes they don't realize it themselves. And for me, one way when I think about this work is that if I were to just imagine myself in their shoes for just a moment, what would I do? I don't think that I would be able to survive in a refugee camp in Chad overnight. I, I, th I think I'd go crazy, right? So to think what it takes to do that night after night is, is extraordinary, and we need to recognize that. They have so much to do, and they don't have time to die. That's the first thing that I can tell you. This brings me to my second colleague. She was an oil engineer who's now turned into a peace activist in Syria. In like, 2011, as the war in Syria was building up, um, and, it, and there was still time for us to get visas for Syrians to come to the United States, because now they can't even, we can't even get visas for them to come and talk to us, uh, we invited her to speak in Washington. And this is one of her messages that, that she gave to the international community at the time, to, 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 the, to the US government and to the UN. She said, you are all helping us kill each other. No one is helping us talk to each other. Seven years later, it still holds. Something like the, the, the estimates are 350 to 500,000 people have been killed. They have millions of refugees that have left the country. They've got millions of people inside the country. We have given them weapons. The Russians have given them weapons. Everybody else has given them weapons. But the amount of money and time, time we've given or opportunities to enable people to talk and think through is something that we haven't really given ser ordinary Syrians. We've, we've got high-level talks going on. But very most of the Syrians I know say neither side represents us. This isn't a football game, right, that you take you know, this side or that side. There's, it's, compl and it's complex, and that complexity needs to be recognized. And this, this, her plea echoes the voices of the women at the front lines in so many other places because they understand that because they see the war coming, that they are the first ones to rise. And they, also, they see that the violence just doesn't get you anywhere, right? Um, I have a colleague called Terry Greenblatt. She was an Israeli peace activist. She's an Israeli-American. And she came to the Security Council in, in 2002. And this is what she said about why women matter at the peace table. She said, women's characteristic life, life experiences gives us the potential for two things. The very special kind of intelligence it's social intelligence and a special kind of courage, social courage. We have developed the courage to cross the lines of difference between us, which are also the lines drawn inside our heads. Even when we are women whose very existence and narratives contradict each other, we will talk, we will not shoot. Right? So this is not denying the differences. This is not denying grievances or pain or issues. It's just saying we don't have to kill each other to sort it out. And, and trust me, eventually, we end up talking. Even when, w these days, even when you have a military victory, they still have to sort out the, the politics afterwards because people still have to live together, right? So, but here's the irony, that no, regardless of the fact that women throughout history have been adherents of nonviolence, and today they are, we don't recognize them, right? We recognize Martin Luther King Jr., we recognize um, the Alfred Nobel, who, you know, the Nobel Peace Prize, but if I were to ask you, how many of you have heard of Bertha von Suttner? Who would put their hands up? Okay, Bertha von Suttner, thank you, always, always one or two. Um, Bertha von Suttner was the woman who inspired Alfred Nobel. She was a renowned peace activist in Europe at the time. And she inspired, it, when he died, they were surprised to find in his will that the Nobel Peace Prize had also been part of his legacy. And it was because of her friendship with him and what she said about the importance of disarmament. And yet nobody knows her. We know about Alfred Nobel. 
the guy who made dynamite, right? <laughs> and then realized it wasn't such a good way of bringing world peace. So, so this, is, this, this, this is a really pervasive issue that for, for modern, and in modern times, in Northern Ireland, in Syria, they are the women who've been at the front lines of peacemaking are either never written into history or they're erased out as we see. It's, it's extraordinary how very soon they just, they disappear because as the, the minute the peace is made, again, the, the male politicians take the lead and take the positions and, and I, you know, they, it's all about power sharing, we're told. I sometimes say if we could change the terminology and say it's about responsibility sharing, maybe they wouldn't be so, you know, in, a, in such a rush to get to the front because, you know, running a devastated country is, is, is pretty hard work if you're, if you're really serious about bringing education and healthcare and so, and so forth to people. So our work has been about trying to not erase and bring back this history and, and, and recognition. We have eight Security Council resolutions, 70, over 70 countries have national action plans recognizing this, this question of women, peace and security. In the United States last year, believe it or not, the Women, Peace and Security Act was passed in Congress. It's a bipartisan bill. And it's a really important tool that I wish all of us could use and, 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 and we can talk about it later if, if we have time. But despite all of this policy, right, our systems are still geared to the fact that guns and violence are the key, are the key ticket to the table. I sometimes say that you know, if the women of Afghanistan suddenly started holding bazookas and threatening people, they would be given free plane tickets to come to wherever the peace talks are. So long as they are actually advocating peace and behaving peacefully and wanting to resolve things peacefully, they're somehow shunted to the side. And the excuses that we give are, are, are quite interesting. Um, the most common one is that people will say, oh, it's their culture. You know, it's women aren't in decision making because it's their culture. Well, if it was cultural, right, then the peace table in Afghanistan would look very different to the one in Colombia or Northern Ireland. It's not about culture, it's about power. We also hear that women are emotional, irrational, idealistic, they don't really understand war and peace um, they, because they weren't part of the fighting. Um, it's almost satirical because if you ask the women of Northern Ireland, when the peace talks were happening, while the men were fighting about the past and being highly emotional, the women were focused on bread and butter issues of education and jobs and practical things like the importance of prison and police reform, right? Um, same in South Africa. In South Africa, women led a national process of security and defense review, pushing back the pressures from the weapons industry. They actually went out to the country and they said, what does security mean to you as the people? What does insecurity mean? I call it dem democratizing the national security of debate. And I sometimes imagine, ima imagine if we could do that in this country to just go out and do a road trip around the country to ask people, what does, what does security mean to you? Because there's such a disconnect between what happens in Washington and what happens on the ground. And then there's the very sort of practical question that, okay, in the midst of all these, these, these wars and all the violence that, that you know, we hear about in, in the news or, um, and, and we assume that, that, that it's, you know, these places are dark and angry and, and, and you know, full of death. What else is going on? Well, I have so many stories from my colleagues in Nigeria and Iraq and Pakistan. Because what I, and what they tell me is that you lift the veil and there is life and light and laughter and color. And what they're trying to do every day is to see the humanity and bring that life back in, even to the guys who are holding the guns and who are a threat to them personally. In Iraq, for example, my, my colleague Fatima was dealing with the problem of young men who were joining militias and who had, who, who had been told that they were doing their religious duty and it was jihad and they had to go and fight uh, for, for, the, for, for, for God. <coughs> and she's been telling them jihad, that jihad is not spilling blood in the streets. Jihad is giving blood in the hospitals. She provides them with programs to actually go and kind of paint school buildings and, and feel pur purposeful in their communities in life and have that sense of belonging. My colleagues in Pakistan have been supporting cultural programs because one of the things that's happened over the years is that as we've had a spread of extremist ideologies, they, it's almost like drowning out the pluralism and coexistence that existed in many of these countries, from Indonesia to the Philippines to Pakistan. These are societies that if you look back to their history, not even that, you know, 50 years ago, Jews and Christians and Muslims and various sects were all living together, right? And yet we've had extremism come in and say, no, only, there's only one truth, and that's justified violence against minorities, it's justified violence against women. What a lot of my colleagues are doing in Pakistan and elsewhere is rekindling that history, 
that past culture of coexistence and pluralism. Showing the kids, look, look through the architecture, through the art, through the music, through the food. We lived together. We built these things together, right? And it's almost what I call social archaeology. It's like digging past through your culture to find it. And, and in doing that, what they're also showing is that these ideas of human rights, coexistence, respect for each other, these are not Western values. These are universal values. Everybody has them. We've had them across the world. So we should own them and reclaim them. These, all of these experiences, as I said, really were the impetus behind our resolution in, in 2000, as, as Karina mentioned. Um, and, and, uh, and as she said, you know, prior, prior to 1325, 1325 is the number, there were 1,324 other resolutions that didn't actually acknowledge that women's, women had agency or women had contributions or a right to be in these spaces. And what's interesting for me is that as women, we didn't just bring the story of women to the table. What we did was we brought the human experience of war. So now they, when they talk about war, they can't just talk about it in terms of this group and that group, this country and that country. It's actually we have to talk about, okay, what's happening to women? What's happening to men? And, and the men part of it is really important. In 2008, um, the issue of sexual violence and conflict was being discussed. Uh, I was involved in uh, behind the scenes in helping sort of with language for the resolution. And we were trying to get in the terminology of men and boys as victims of sexual violence because they are, and it's the, it's the most silent taboo out there across many countries. And it was getting crossed out. The government of Libya at the time was on the council and they, and they were crossing it out. So we put in civilians. We put in people. We, would, we, we could say women and girls, but to include everybody else, when they wouldn't let us use men and boys, we put in civilians. The minute the resolution was passed, one of the first things that happened was that men in various countries started saying, hey, we're also victims. And so that resolution was a, through women we got to men. That resolution was a door opener for men and boys who had been victims to also come forward and talk about it. Others think that, that this, you know, sometimes people think that the, this, this agenda is just about equal rights for women. Um, to that I say that if, if, we're, if we were just fighting for equality in the status quo, I would have retired a couple of years ago when the US military um, announced that they were allowing women to have equal opportunities for combat roles, right? I respect anybody who wants to do anything and I respect women who want to join the army. But to me, for me, this agenda is about equality of a different sort. It's not simply to give my daughters, who are going to be 18 soon, the same opportunities and responsibilities as men to fight, to defend, to maim, to kill, and to die if we ever have a draft or anything like that. It's actually to prevent wars so that neither my daughters or your sons or you guys ever have to go to war or other kids anywhere else ever have to experience this violence. And, and for this, I also want to share with you the story of a colleague of ours in, in Pakistan, Hasina Nizad. For three, she's a, again, school teacher turned peace builder. For the past three years, she's been working with men, village chiefs, imams, young men, teachers, to teach them about conflict resolution and violence against women. And I had done some work on, on the issue of men and what happens to young men in, in, in crisis settings. And I suggested to her that it would be really important to give the men a space to talk about their own, their own experiences and their own fears and traumas of what it's like to live with, with the, the threat of violence around them. And she did this. She, she brought together small groups, uh, safe spaces. And one of the things that she came back with, she said, she said when we started talking about these, these Afghan men, now again, think about it. When we th think of Afghan men, we think of the Taliban and we think of guns and so, so forth. So these guys started crying because no one had ever talked to them from that perspective. Nobody had ever asked them, what's it like to be a young boy growing <coughs> up in the middle of war? That, that human side had never been, been brought up. Nobody had asked them about their fears and their anxieties. So again, going back to today's theme, it is about the ri equal right of men and women to peace. That is really at the heart of our agenda. And I'm going to end with a couple of thoughts. Number one, wars, violence, anything of that nature are, is not a natural disaster. It's not inevitable. It's not an earthquake that we can't predict. It's not a hurricane that we predict and, and you know, maybe it's to do with climate change and maybe we can do some, something about it. Every act of violence is a decision that somebody somewhere is making, right? And people plan wars. They lay the groundwork. They tell us stories. 
they lull us into believing that the next war is inevitable. And for me today, as, as I'm standing here today, what scares me is that in Washington, they're laying the groundwork for the next war, which is against my homeland, right? They want us to be scared. They want us to think that Iran is the threat. It really isn't. We can talk about that later. But it's the, it's the playbook that comes out, and, and you have to look behind and see who, who's benefiting from this, because it's not going to be us, and it's, and it's not going to be the world, that's for sure. The good news is that these decisions could be prevented, right? If we, if we are vigilant, if we can actually call out and not be intimidated by the so-called national security ex experts, um, we'll find that these strong men are actually straw men. Right? There's nothing behind what they're saying. And, and what's interesting is that they don't have a plan B. They want to get, they want regime change, but you say to them, we tried that in Iraq. What happened the day after? We did it in Libya. What did we learn 10 years after Iraq? Right? There is no plan B. Right? So, so we need to challenge them about these things. And, and it's, a, you know, I come back to my kids sometimes because in the second grade they had a, um, in their classroom, they had the cool down corner and the talk it out corner. And they were seven years old. I, there was an exhibition at the, at a, at the art museum on, uh, from, from Afghanistan and it was the, the Afghan treasures that had been hidden for 30 years. The, the, the curator at the Afghan museum in Kabul had hidden them for 30 years because of the war and, and finally they were out, they were being taken around as an exhibition. So I said to my kids, you know, it's, we're gonna go see these treasures. They've been hidden for 30 years. There was a war and they looked at me <laughs> And they said, 30 years of war? I said, yes, you know, they've, they've had 30 years of war. And one of them said, well, why didn't they just go to the cool down corner and talk <laughs> it out, <laughs> right? Um, and <laughs> yeah, so, so, um, so this, is, this, is, this is the reality that, that, that we're um, living with. And, and I want to end, I guess, with another um, story from, from, from the kids because it's about accountability. Right, about who we hold accountable and how we hold each other accountable, but also very spe spe specifically how we hold our representatives accountable for this kind of work. Again, when they were little, I used to say to them, hitting is not an option. They were twins, they would pull each other's hair and so forth. Um, and I would just walk every time that happened, hitting is not an option, until one day they were about three or four years old and, and I thought they were grown up at the time and, and I said, you know, they were doing something and I said, you know, you stand in front of me, you look me in the eye, otherwise you're gonna get a spanking and this little voice piped up and she said, you said hitting wasn't an option. <laughs> 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 so, so, so yes, kids learn, kids can do it. And, and so as I say, I'm gonna end with saying, you know, let's have, um, not, let's not just have one peace day, let's have 364 peace days, and, or let's tell the, the guys and the people who want to benefit from, from warmongering and war games, let's ask them to take it to their, to their war games room and let people who are genuinely serious about peace get on with the task of peace building in our world. Thank you very much. Today we're listening to a forum with the amazing Sanam Naragi Andralini, co-founder and executive director of the International Civil Society Action Network. We're about to begin the audience Q&A. We welcome questions from everyone, City Club members, guests, students, and those of you joining via radio, broadcast, or live stream. If you'd like to tweet a question, please tweet it at the City Club, and our staff will try to work it into the program. Holding the microphones today are membership and customer experience manager, Corey Isler, over here, and content coordinator, Bliss Davis, over there. May we have the first question, please? Thank you for being here. I just wanted to ask you, do you think what's going on right now all over the world with uh, people protesting immigrants and refugees could be classified as a form of war? It worries me because, um, you know, when I was in 1978-79, when, when we ended up in England, um, I was under my mother's, you know, I was, a, I, was, I was a child, but we were refugees. And, um, and I look around the world now, and I think that so many people that are out there who are fleeing violence and war want to go back to their homes. They want to go back and rebuild, right? So, so on the one hand, we're threatening them here and, and we're mistreating them in, in wherever they may be. You know, we, we, we vilify them and we, th we say that they're criminals and, and so forth. On the other hand, what they really want to do is go back home and, and rebuild, but they can't because we're not really doing enough to bring 
not just the end of war, but protection for them to go back so that as and when they go back, they're not being attacked by their own governments, right? Which was, which was part of the problem in the, in the first place. And the other thing which I find um, extraordinary is that you know, we, the minute you flee your country because of war, uh, you get the label of refugee. You are no longer an engineer or a doctor or somebody who can do something useful in the societies that you go that you enter into, right? Um, and and that to me is also a tragedy because so many of the people I know were incredibly talented, and and could have done so much, and yet some of the laws don't allow them to work, right? And even now I have colleagues who are Syrian who you know ended up in Turkey, and they have become critical in dealing and helping other Syrian refugees come to Turkey. We have a, we have a colleague who's been running computer sort of centers and, and language centers for women from Sy for Syrian women. Um, to help them cope because because they're widows now, right? And they, they need to, to, to earn uh, an income. So so thinking about people as people as opposed to refugees who are looking for handouts um, is part of the shift that we need to, to be considering. Um, you mentioned that our Congress passed a bipartisan act, the Women, Peace, and Security mm -hmm. Act, and so this agenda has actually been sort of taken on board by our own government. Can you give us more details about that? What did the law actually say, and what implications does that have for American foreign policy? The, the potential implication is huge, right? Because if they actually want to take the word, the literal word and the spirit of it, um, it would mean that, you know, in the case of Yemen, in the case of Afghanistan, in the cases where the U.S. has such a prominent role, we would be using our influence to ensure that the voices of peace, women peace builders are, are it, you know, present in a systematic way in, in, the, in the peace process. That's the potential. Uh, the reality of it is that uh, the, the um, law was passed last year. They asked for a national strategy. And right now, uh, the Department of Defense and the Department of State and, and various government bodies are coming up with their, their component of the national strategy. We're waiting to see what happens. It hasn't been particularly um, inclusive. Uh, they, they consult occasionally with civil society, but it's, but it's really an internal government process. And, and I, again, I worry that it's not going to be focused really on, on enabling and listening to those voices who have the solutions. For example, Afghan women right now. You know, Afghan women are very concerned about what's happening with the Afghan peace talks. And where are on our envoys in terms of saying they should be part of the peace process, right? Or Yemen. We can stop the Yemen war. We give the bombs to the Saudis. It's, you know, we could, if enough people could call Congress, maybe we could get the, the bill passed on stopping the Yemen war. Um, that would make a huge difference. Uh, so, so, yeah, so it, it, it's a question of, on the one hand, you know, what, what the, the, the bill is passed, how will Congress keep the government accountable? How does the government actually think about these things? But it's also to what extent the public even knows and can, can engage um, in this. But the potential, I think, is, is phenomenal. Ms. Naraj Anderlini, did I get it right? Yes, thank you. Um, <clears throat> demographics, they should be suggesting that we're about to enter a golden age for women. Uh, I watched my own profession, the law, go from a scattering of women to, I believe today, more than half of the women, in, of the people in law school are women. <clears throat> Certainly in the practice as I've seen it, their role knows no real boundaries. The president of the club is the manager of, uh, of her firm. <coughs> so, uh, and, and also I watched the sexual revolution, women gain control over childbearing, uh, families are smaller, women can uh, control how they relate to their household work, they can be professionals as much as they wish to. Uh, I have a daughter who has lived that promise. So we should be coming into a time when the education of women, their ability to control their home life, should give them enormous uh, energy, uh, opportunity that they, that they could use to m move into national security issues. Um, and I wonder if something's holding them back, um, or if you think um, it's flowing forward in about the way it should. Thank you. Um, lots of different parts of your question. 
cer certainly on the fa family and childbearing, we're, we're, at s we're at a very precarious stage right now <laughs> um, in terms of controlling our own bodies. But, um, but on the question of the national security space, yes, in, in a, in a, and this agenda has, been, has shed a light on these issues. Um, uh, there's an organization called the Women in International Security that on Monday will be uh, publishing their report of Washington, D.C. think tanks. And you know what percentage have women as the helm? What percentage have women as experts in, in foreign policy and national security? And I don't want to um, you know spill the beans, but it's quite striking how the how the gaps are still persistent in, in that in that way. So so we have that challenge that that you know women are coming through, but um, but they're still in a sense invisible. Not, not necessarily glass ceilings, but, but there's still things that, that hold us back. M my own experience um, is that I never really thought that I had to fight for equality. I, I, went to, I come from a family, on both sides of my family, a very, very strong women, pioneers in Iran. Um, I went to a girls' school, and you know, I came in wanting to do peace and security work. And one of the things that struck me was that I didn't have any female role models uh, who were older than me or my bosses who had actually done the job with children. So, so I'm, you know, I was kind of figuring it out for myself uh, over time, and, and I have some funny stories to tell you about what, what it's like to, to, to juggle that and juggle international kind of travel and development and, and stuff. And so, so I think that to make it work, it is my generation's uh, responsibility to open those doors and to unpack the policies. And, and the human, in a sense, there's a human resource dimension to this, right? So for example, when I started working um, in the US, um, I was traveling and I realized that the cost of childcare for when I'm away or when I had an evening event or something was skyrocketing. Um, and so I went back to my organization and I said, you know, can we get compensation for this? And we ended up with a policy that was childcare, dog care, and parent care, right? Anybody who has a domestic issue that has to be dealt with, um, you know, when you travel, because dog care is also really expensive, um, you know, you can talk to your manager and you can get compensation. It made a tremendous difference to us as women, but it also made a difference to the men in the organization, right? Because they had, some of them had stay-at-home wives, but for the wife, you know, for the women at home, it's hard work to have, to, you know, constantly looking after little kids, right? So that, those kinds of small things, I'm, and, and I remember talking to my sister at the time, she was in the financial sector, and she, she, they looked at their human resource policies, and they could get gym membership and parking, you know, uh, sort of, I don't know, membership and things like that. But there was nothing about saying, you know, you don't want the gym membership, but you actually do want to tap into the same amount, but for childcare. These are not big, this, this isn't rocket science. These are just looking at it in terms of practical ways that we can enable women to continue working. Working from home, I have a, one of my colleagues, we have a fund um, that in the last three years, we've given over $2 million of grants to women, in peace, uh, women doing peace work in 21 countries. Um, and she's just had her second baby, and she works from home, right? I, 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 I'm perfectly happy. As long as the work is done, what does it matter whether she's coming to the office nine to five? Maybe she wants to work from eight to 11, right? And in the morning, she's, she, she, she can't work. But it, the issue is the, you know, the, the structures have to be more flexible to allow for this kind of work. And then finally, I think the other part of, the, of all this is that we need our male colleagues to walk with us. Right, um, and and this this is you know the, the the UN actually initiated a he for she campaign, saying you know we need male champions, but at one point there was one country that hosted an all male conference, to talk about what men can do for women. <laughs> it's like no, this doesn't work. <laughs> you know, if you want to work with us, you know, what I say is you you know sometimes it's to do with networks and people that we know and the access that people that that people have. Open the door and, and help us with the access, right? Let open the doors and enable us to be part of the networks because so much of it is hidden old boys clubs or, or, or just other systems that are in place that, that are invisible. So, so thinking about it in a, in a very practical way is, is part of what we, what we need to be also doing to enable the, as you say, the next generation to make it and, and for it to be balanced. And, and then finally, I really hope that um, the next generation of men or uh, our fathers uh, see the joy and benefit of being more involved with their kids' lives, right? Because it's, um, I have my, my, my former husband is Italian, and I always say, you know, how many kids speak their father's language? 
right? And it's because he was an academic and he was able to spend time with them. And, and that's, that's priceless. So, so thinking about that other side of it, of the value and benefits to men, of, of opening up and sharing the, bur the bur burdens both at work but also at home, I think is really important. Thank you. Um, what advice would you give? We've got a lot of young women who are here today. What advice would you give to them about um, for them to use their voice and get involved in these kinds of issues, issues that are important to them that are underrepresented by women? Thank you. Um, I would say uh, be bold. Don't be afraid of, you know, don't be intimidated. Don't think that you don't know, but make sure that you do know, right? Do your homework. Read up. Know the history of the work that's been done. Because one of the biggest challenges that is, is that, you know, if we think about the world of science, right? Um, if I had my iPhone, you know, the iPhone is this big, right? 30 years ago, it was a mainframe computer. But scientists collaborate, and they work, and they build, and, and it moves towards the iPhone. In the social sciences, and certainly in, in the realm of you know, de development and, and diplomacy and, and, and so forth, there is a tendency for us to not kind of build on what was done before. And, and that happens very often because people haven't thought to say, okay, where did they take it? You know, as I say, you know, this question, you brought it this far, I would be very happy to retire tomorrow and become a gardener, um, but I would want to make sure that whatever I've done, can, I can hand it over to somebody else so that they can take it to the next level. And so, so the next generation really ne needs to know all that. The other thing which I find really interesting is that um, if, we, if we think about Ruth Bader Ginsburg and her generation, they were fighting to get to the universities. There were very few sw spots for women at Harvard or Cornell or whatever. Then you get Hillary Clinton's generation. And the spots had opened. They could be there. And they were fighting to get into the boardrooms and the spaces for decision making to be just like the guys, right? It was, I'm, I'm, I've talked to diplomats who said, you know, we would come in and we would be suited up like the men, right? Just my generation, we took it in a way for granted that we were in the room and we were saying, wait a second, now I want to rearrange things. You know, what's, why is this policy like that? And why can't we think about peace and security from a human dimension? And so we were trying to be change it from, from within. What I'm seeing with the next generation is that they have the social media platforms. You know, we didn't have the media at our hand. We didn't have a means of communication. These guys, they are the social media experts. They can create their own agenda. If you look at what the, um, what the, uh, the kids from Florida have done, they've changed the national debate, not by getting on CNN, but by getting on Twitter and, and MySpace and God knows Instagram and I don't know what else, what else you guys do, right? It's, um, and through that being, becoming the news. They've also learned, and this is, this is a sad part, but it's an important tactic, they've also learned that we live in a country right now where our vote or our roles as citizen has, citizens has been so diminished because of the power of the lobby groups and the different industries, right? But they understand that they have the power of being a consumer, right? So you go after the companies that are selling the guns or are advertising. And again, we see that from those kids. And so, so I think to understand that you have a power, to have a vision, to be inclusive, it, it, th these things are really important. But, um, but don't take for granted and diminish all the hard work that was done in the past. Um, and, and, so, and, and we see it, especially with, with the reproductive health issue, right? That, that there is, you know, people will come after you what, when, when you're a threat to the status quo, right? For a long time, we could just cruise. Now, you know, as women become a threat to the status quo and the vested interests, you get a backlash. And so we have to anticipate that and understand and think, well, how do we, how do we humanize it and reach out and, and bring others along so that we're not just talking to, to, our, to our own cohort of people? Um, so building upon the, the previous um, woman's question, you know, I think there are a lot of people in this room who are working in the women's empowerment space locally, either, either professionally or as volunteers. What are some things that we can do to kind of scale up what we're doing to have a more international impact? Oh, that's a, that's a big question. I, th I think, you know, the, the, I, th I would say that, again, it's partly just looking at the issues and deciding what, which piece of it speaks to you. There are so many different challenges out there um, and so many good things that are going on. And it's, it, it, it would be much more effective to say, you know, I'm looking, let, let's, let's say you decide that you were interested in uh, the question of women peacemakers. Um, you know, you don't need to take on every single country, 
But you might say, you know, the U.S. has a particular role vis-a-vis -vis Yemen or Syria or Afghanistan. Let's really drill down and figure out what we can do in this country on that issue um, and leverage our power as citizens and then connect with other people in other states. Because one thing that we, we know from Washington is that it doesn't matter how much, we, how much advocacy we do on the Hill over there. What really matters is what they hear back home in their districts. So, so that question of bringing, you know, bringing back the WPS, the, the Women, Peace, and Security Act, back to the states and into the districts and for people to understand how these things, actually the international relates with the domestic as well. Right, because when we're spending so much on our military, when we have a Pentagon budget where they can't be audited <laughs> because uh, you know billions, they don't know what some of the billions of where they've gone, right? Um, that means it's money that could be coming back into our own communities for our schools and our hospitals and our universities and our, and our bridges. So, so we need to see that, that connection. But, but I would say, yeah, look at this, the, the menu of options and, and, and see which one it is that, that really grabs your attention. So I just want to ask, how do you think that increasing representation of women in um, political uh, peace negotiations, such as Theresa May and the Brexit negotiations and the status of the Northern Irish border, will affect the nature of political peace negotiations going forward? Thank you. That's a great question. So, so this is this is one of the issues that that historically, you know, when when people say, oh well, you know, we had Golda Meir and we had Mrs. Thatcher, and they were, you know. They weren't sort of peacemakers. Absolutely, you know, we have, if we just have individual women, and, and I do think it's also a generational issue, that if we just have individual women who've had to come through the power structures, they're not necessarily gonna be any different, right? And so for me, the essence, I mean, what's really transformative about the work that I've done, and, and I'm trying to do, is to say, you know, government has, you have women in political sp spaces, we need to educate them or raise their awareness so that they feel comfortable to actually have that lens that the women's movements bring, the feminist movements sometimes bring, because very often women in politics are scared of doing that, right? They wanna be like, they fall in line with, 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 the, with the political parties. So, so that's one part of it. But the, the part to me which is the most transformative is that we can't just allow the peace, Brexit or whatever it is, to be just decided by politicians on either side of the aisle. Right? We as the public should have a role in that. And so when, we, when I take it back down to sort of, you know, the, the, let's say the peace process in Yemen, what we're fighting for is to say, there's the Yemeni government, you know, they are what they are. We have armed groups, they are what they are. But guns and violence shouldn't be the only thing. If you're a peace actor, you should also, and you've demonstrated that you're doing relief work, that you know about ceasefires, that you've, you've protected people. Surely, if we're talking about peace, the peace actors should also be there, and, and as I say, they often come with very pragmatic solutions. On the question of Brexit, personally, um, the way I see it is that uh, if the Brexit Brexiteers genuinely believe they have the majority vote, they shouldn't be worried about a second vote. They can get the majority and, and you know. But, um, but if we have a second vote and uh, people like me who live abroad get to actually vote, including all the young people who didn't vote last time and, and so forth, and we get a majority that doesn't want to leave Europe, then that's also democracy. So right. So so the vote shouldn't. The vote should just be a point of uh, confirmation. Um, but we'll see what happens. Uh, it's going to be an interesting, interesting one. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> the peace movement in this country crested during the Cold War and then in. Um, opposing the invasion of Iraq. What advice do you have for the peace movement in this country? Uh, say Peace Action and other of the national organizations that have affiliates around the country. Th thank you for that. I, th I think it's really important that we kind of revive the, the interest. I f you know, um, in Washington and, and around the country, there's Code Pink. That, that was really the voice that mobilized ir against Iraq. They are now the voice that is out there against the potential war on Iran, war and sanctions on Iran. Um, uh, just two days ago, Medea Benjamin, who's one of the co-founders, was in, at an event in Washington, and the new U U uh, US envoy to Iran spoke, and then he sat down to have a question and answer. And Medea Benjamin, who's, I think, you know, under five feet tall and, and very slim, went to the podium to say, why are we kind of, why are we having this playbook of another war? This is exactly what we did with Iraq. These were the kinds of things that we said. 
you know, why, why are we allied with Saudi Arabia? I mean, you know, let's go back to 9-11 and, and so forth. And it was an interesting um, visual because this one tiny lady was suddenly surrounded by three big, tall men who literally manhandled her to take her off. So she was not a physical threat to anyone. And, and this, this to me is the question that, that they are afraid of the truth and they're sort of shielded from, from these voices, right? Um, and we need to have more of those voices in many spaces because it, it, we can't just have, you know, we need the activist space and, and, and the, the very vocal, but we need to be everywhere. And, we, and, and a part of it is, again, going back to understanding what is being done in, you know, in terms of the, of the preparation. And, and I understand you know, that what's going on in, the, in our country right now is so complicated because education is being threatened, environment is being threatened, so many things are, are, are being upended that it's, really, it's easy to lose focus of the, the foreign policy side of the story. But if I were to tell you, you know, when I talk to my partners around the world, um, they say, you know, when America catches a cold, the rest of us catch pneumonia. And so, so I think we have a responsibility to, to hold it, <laughs> to, to rein it in, um, so, that, so that this doesn't spill out and become, uh, you know, an even worse problem around the world as well. Today at the City Club, we're listening to an extraordinary forum with Sanam Naragianderlini, co-founder and executive director of the International Civil Society Action Network. Community partners for today's program include the C Cleveland Council on World Affairs, the Floristone Mathers Center for Women, and Global Cleveland. Our hospitality partner is the Metropolitan at the Nine Hotel. We appreciate your partnership in promoting today's forum. We welcome guests at a table hosted by Cleveland Peace Action, Additionally, we welcome students from Beaumont School, Flow Home School Co-op, Horizon Science Academy, St. Joseph Academy, and St. Martin de Porres High School. Student participation in City Club forums is provided by many foundations, including the William M. Weiss Foundation. We thank you all for being here today. This brings us to the end of today's forum. Thank you, Ms. Naragi Anderlini, very much for being with us here in Cleveland. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. The forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated.